Hi there, welcome to The Accidental Pop Star here on YouTube. My name is Ali Beg. I will tell you what this channel is all about in just a moment, but if you're watching for the very first time, just let me give you a quick refresher. So I was once a member of 90s boy band Bad Boys Inc. We were signed to A&M Records. We had relative success in the UK and abroad, but we then split up in the spring of 1995. Now at that time, I was already starting to question the type of person that I was becoming. To be honest with you, I was quite uncomfortable with it and the whole experience left many unanswered questions so the idea for this channel is to speak to pop stars both past and present about their own experiences see if we can find common ground and discover the DNA which to be quite honest with you remains the same now as much as I'm delighted to bring you the household names what I also want to do on this channel is explore and talk to those who followed their dream but for whatever reason, it didn't quite go according to plan. So let me introduce to you a gentleman called Terry Ronald. Now, Terry was signed to MCA Records in the late 80s to early 90s, and he had relative success before the machine took a hold of him and spat him out, which meant he was forced to reinvent himself. Through his bravery, his courage, and his self-belief, he became a hugely successful writer, producer, author, vocal arranger, and novelist. He's worked with some of the world's biggest acts, Carrie Minogue, Westlife, Jerry Halliwell, and Danny Minogue, to name but a few. He's got a brilliant story, a fascinating one, which I really hope will inspire you. Welcome to the accidental pop star, Terry Ronald. Hi Terry, it's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for hey. jumping on. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much. Right, I want to jump straight in um, sure. and go right back to the days when, you know, the sort of the, the, the weeks and the months that were leading up to you signing your deal with MCA Records. Can you recall if you actually gave yourself a timeline of achieving a deal? Uh, well, I think we gave ourselves timelines and it, that was with a band originally. And then we gave ourselves a timeline, but we didn't reach it. So we just went on and on and on and on. And uh, I think we got a deal from doing a showcase um, and um, uh, our manager, Jackie, arranged a showcase for us with a woman called Melody from MCA Records. And she came down and it seemed to go really quickly from there and the band was signed, but obviously the band didn't go on for that long. And then I just stayed on as a solo artist. Okay. Understood. So after the signing, did you mm. ever actually sit down with representatives of MCA records? And now that you were a solo artist, did you ever yeah. feel that you were in now control of your own destiny and what was going to go for you forward? <sighs> Um, I think when when I was a solo artist, you mean, I think yeah. that I seemed to have a bit more say because I wrote my own songs mm. and um, I kind of pushed forward with that. So I, I feel like I had a bit of a say in obviously musical direction and because it was there was just one of me it was easier i think that when we were the band it was all a bit more well, this is what's happening but when it was me it was easier for me to be involved in meetings and say this is what i want this is what i like i could put my ideas forward to an extent mm. um so yeah there were a few of those were you comfortable with decisions being made on your behalf not all the time no because i think um you know, coming from being a, a gay man, for instance, in the music industry, uh, you know, in the early 90s, there still weren't that many out, you know, artists really um, at, at that time. And I think I was, uh, I mean, I was openly gay, I have been since I was 16 years old. So I think around the, uh, the, um, the record company is particularly, you know, it was a very kind of, it was a big boys club, you know, the music industry at that time. And it was, you know, nearly always sort of straight guys that were, were the running the show. So there was always that element of like, oh, you know, make sure, you know, 
that he's not too camp, make sure he's not wearing any jewellery, make sure, you know, there was, there was restrictions on me as, as we went down the line that I, I felt a bit stifled by. You see, that's really interesting, Terry, because it's it's something that I was always hugely uncomfortable with knowing that mm. in Bad Boys Inc, you know, we had two gay guys and they were yeah. basically told to almost pretend that they weren't gay, mm. which is basically telling them that you can't have your own identity. You have to forget who you are and you almost have to act like somebody else. Right. Which I, at the time, I could not understand that thinking. At, I got it to a degree, but I just couldn't understand it. And it was only sort of a few years after we split up, I must have, I thought to myself, that must have been so difficult for these guys to pretend mm. to be something that they're not actually. Um, did, did you feel Absolutely. that? I, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether anyone ever told me I couldn't say I was gay. I think yeah. there were people, there was the inference that people would prefer me to be ambiguous about it. Okay. Um, I certainly wasn't particularly bothered, wasn't particularly flamboyant at that time. I had been earlier when I was younger, but at the time I was doing my solo stuff, I, I, I really wasn't. Um, but I think, I think where you're coming from particularly is, I think being in a, in a boy band with the, with the kind of people, you know, the kind of audience you were marketed at, is it would be even more so. Mm. And I think that kind of went forward with, you know, with, you know, Westlife and with Boyzone and, sure. and all those other bands, because they all had gay members in, in them, you know, so yeah, yeah. I get that. Yeah. Why, why do you think that so many artists, particularly boy bands, girl bands, that, that type of artist, why do you think they become puppets on a string? I I don't know I don't know whether they all become puppets on a string. I don't have their experience. I think that sometimes, you know, there are there are a lot of people that you realise don't have much of a say in what they do. And I think it's because they're put together by management companies and record companies and they don't necessarily have a sense of their own own identity yeah. as a band, you know, like for instance, you know, back in the day, Blur or Oasis or bands like that that have come together and they have formed their own identity, you know, with with other bands that are, you know, sort of mixed boy bands or girl bands, whoever, um, they don't, they're put together. And so there's always a, already an idea of what they're going to be. Mm. And it's not necessarily something that's come from them. Mm. So did you make sure that you were not going to become a puppet on a string was that quite clear in your mind yes and I think for me it was easier because I as I say it was just me yeah I was writing my own songs I was co-producing my own songs I I sort of had a you know and, and I, I was I suppose had come from a, a background of uh, knowing what I wanted uh, and and it wasn't always the case there were times when I felt like I couldn't get what I wanted but it or, or I couldn't do exactly what I wanted but it was I think to a certain extent I I was seen as an artist that that because I did my own material and I had a strong musical identity in that way I wasn't kind of expected to fit in boxes in the way that some sort of manufactured bands might have been when we first signed our, our record deal with A&M back in 93, we received what was uh, a small advancement. Yeah. Now, at the time, I remember thinking to myself, okay, this will get me through a few months, but it's certainly not going to get me through the next year, and it's certainly not going to get me through the next couple of years. So I started to actually worry and wonder where my income was actually going to come from, because it was never explained. Did you have any sort of similar experiences? Well, yeah, because I, I think the, the, the deal I got, although I, it felt like, a, you know, when I was with my doing my solo stuff, 
I, it felt like a, you know, a reasonable amount of money for me. Mm. It really wasn't a lot of money, especially compared to what, you know, some other acts had got. Yeah. And so I, but I don't think I thought about it. I kind of think I thought that, oh, you know, this is, this will do for now and, and then I'll be successful. But unfortunately that didn't happen in the way I wanted. So yeah, as it went down the line, I, I did really struggle financially and Again, luckily, I wrote my own song, so I was able to get a publishing deal as well. Um, but again, you know, none of it was none of it was a huge amount of money, and it certainly wasn't going to see me through years and years of you know what 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 was to come. Mm. You, you mentioned that you had management beforehand. Did you stick with mm. the same management after you signed your solo deal? No, oh, we okay. when we came towards the end of the band, we changed um, we changed management, and I kept that manager pretty much throughout my solo career. Okay, and so was that sort of financial aspect explained to you by your manager, or did you just have to sort of trust in the process, Terry? Uh, of of how much money I would get, yeah, of how you were going to earn. Well. I, I kind of just had to, I, I, I suppose I, I kind of knew what I was getting at the start and I suppose I, I knew what was on the contract. So I, 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 I sort of had an understanding. I think yeah. that what I didn't so much appreciate was the fact that literally everything that happens is coming, you know, is coming, you're paying for, yeah. you know, so you're not going to earn any extra money until the record company is recouped so and and i think that's back in the day i think that, you know record companies were really you know taking the piss with with the stuff i mean you know i remember lots of unnecessary money unnecessary money being spent on whether it was lunches whether it was launches for this that and the other you know i remember a lot of stuff happening in my under in my kind of realm in my name that was probably unnecessary and i didn't realize i was you know in, in going to end up paying for your album your first album roma yeah um you recorded it in new york is that right that's right okay who made the decision to go to new york to do that well that's an interesting story because um with my album being kind of quite sort of you know soul soul infused i suppose and my influences came from that kind of american soul genre uh my a and r person at the time had a band in the uk that he thought would be good for me to work with um but the i had really enjoyed the the uh production on uh the band hue and cry you know the band Hue and Cry. Yeah, of course. Oh, I loved Hue and Cry. Yeah. So I said, "Oh God, I loved the production on that." So my management had contacted the guys that produced that, and they came and met me, listened to the demos, and they loved the songs. Oh, cool. And they said, "Well, we we you know we would love to take you, bring you to New York where we work, and put you with all these amazing musicians." Now my A and R team wanted me to work with these guys in Newcastle to record the the. the for, for Harvey and Jimmy to come to England and work with these guys that they put me with. So I did some work with these guys and they were fantastic. But I mean, you know, when it came down to it, you know, the, the, the option for me of going to New York and recording with these amazing legendary session musicians or doing it with a, with a bunch of nice guys in Newcastle, there was no competition. So I said, basically said to my manager, you fucking make this happen. <laughs> I'm not fucking going to Newcastle <laughs> to make my album you know, when there's the option of going to New York. So that's that's basically what happened. OK, um, because you broke the European market really quickly, which was absolutely yeah. fantastic. I was looking at some old clips today and it was brilliant to see <laughs> you sort of, on, you know, on Spanish TV and everything really yeah. quickly. Um, but did you have an understanding that to break that market is a, is a completely different style almost because I always felt that the European market was different to the UK market. Do you see where I'm coming from? 
Yeah, I think in some ways, there's obviously within Europe, you've got a lot of different countries. So you're yeah. marketed in each country and some of them pick it up and some of them don't. I mean, there were some, you know, there were some countries that it worked and some countries that it didn't. I was at least lucky. Mine didn't happen in the UK, really, mm. apart from a couple of club things. So club hits. So I was grateful that, that it did happen in Europe. And I think the difference in Europe for me was that the record companies in the territories where it worked for me were a bit more kind of open and um, you know enthusiastic I think there was a bit of a I think the UK at the time was so um, you know dance orientated and not even that great dance it was before all the really great dance stuff came out it was at the beginning of all that stuff and so what I was doing wasn't getting through on the radio, whereas in Europe, there seemed to be much more scope of what was being played on the radio, which is why I think in places like Spain and Italy and Sweden, I kind of came through better than I did, you know, in my own country. Why do you think you struggled to get radio play in the UK? Do you think it was purely down to the sound? I think it was a little bit down to the sound. I mean, who can say, you know, if the records didn't spark the attention of, you know, the, the, the DJs and the pluggers, you know, that's the luck of the draw. Yeah. Uh, you know, I knew I sound, you know, I, I knew I sounded a bit like George Michael. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody said that and that's not wasn't really my intention. I think it was just a white guy singing soulful songs. And when I started, he was still in Wham and not not really doing that kind of stuff. So um, uh, so I don't know. I really don't know. I do know that I struggled because every, the dance, there seemed to be a massive emphasis, emphasis on on dance music coming out of the UK and, and I got a bit lost in all that, I think. Yeah. Did you ever sit down with like your, you know, your, your PR people or your media people, um, particularly radio pluggers, because to get the playlist for radio was vital yeah. to having success, you know, whether you get the A, the B, the C or the D mm. playlist. Did you ever sit down and say, guys, what's going on? Is there an issue? What can I do to help? Oh, do you know what? I, I wish I could remember. I'm sure I would have had that discussion. I, 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 I remember feeling frustrated yeah. and always being thinking, right, well, it's on, on to the next one. Um, but I, I do think there is an element is of, I'm not sure, I, I, around the time when I was signed, there were a couple of acts signed for ridiculous amounts of money, ridiculous amounts of money. Okay. There were pet projects of certain people within the, within the, I mean, one of them literally never saw the light of day and they got signed for an obscene amount of money and it was all a bit weird and dodgy, to be honest. Um, but because of that, there were, um, I don't think I was seen as a priority because so much went into these acts that were, you know, that were signed for huge amounts of money, two of which I can think of that barely saw the light of day ultimately. Um, and, and I think that's the problem. If you're not a priority, you're going to struggle. Yeah. Record company politics, eh? Mm. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about fame because obviously once you sort of started to break Europe, get on TV shows and do well and have top 10 hits, did you want fame? Were you comfortable with your level of fame rising? Uh, well, I, I didn't ever feel fame, particularly famous. Well, I suppose when I was, when I was in Spain and stuff uh, for a while, there was that moment. It wasn't something that I don't think I achieved the level for it to be, to affect me enough to, you know, be damaging or particularly amazing, you know? Um, so I, I, I find it hard to answer that because I don't ever think that I achieved the level of fame where it would have been substantially, you know, affecting me. Okay, that's interesting. So do you think in your own mind that you were not famous? I don't know whether I'm famous. I I, this is always a weird question to ask someone. 
to, to, to answer because I don't feel like I'm famous, but even now people know me and recognize me or know my music or know this particular song or now know my book, but I've never felt famous. Okay. That's it. I've, go on. Yeah. Go on, go on. I feel like I felt, I felt like, you know, well known in certain, in certain areas, but not famous in the, in the, in the way that uh, people are who I've worked with, yeah. you know, other artists I've worked with. Yeah, because there are there are different levels of fame w without a shadow yes. of a doubt. Um, but it, again, what's quite interesting, Terry, from your own point of view is um, you, if people recognised you on the street, yeah. or if people saw you and, and you know, they, they recognise you and think, that's, I know that guy from TV, or I, he sings that song. Yeah. Did it make you feel famous or because you didn't feel that in your own head, did you just sort of take it in your stride? I think I took it in my stride. Yeah. Okay. Very much. Yeah. I think, I, I think, uh, you know, it, as I said, if it was at a level where there was like teams of people every five minutes running, running after me, that might've been a different thing, but I think I pretty much took it in my stride, you know, and after shows, I mean, I did big support slots, um, when I was an artist in the UK and I got a huge reaction from my support slots, which that's why it was so frustrating that, um, you know, that I didn't get go further because I was so well received. Well, you know, when you see a lot of support acts now and, you know, you see people milling in and out and no one really paying attention. Mm. By the time I'd done a couple of dates with Hall and Oates, which I did like a 26 date tour with them, people were coming, people were heard about and were coming to see me. I mean, it was full on. And I got a lot of attention after that. And I think, you know, I don't know whether that's being famous or not, but I, I do feel like I kind of took that in my stride and it was more about the music than it was about me, you know? Okay, because you, you, you continued to release records from the album. But, it, but obviously it wasn't quite working. There was something in no. the mechanism that just wasn't working. So did it come to a point, Terry, when you actually thought to yourself, maybe in the pr privacy of your own home, I don't know, when you thought, this, this is not working. I have to think about what I'm going to do next. Did you ever have that moment? Um, I think, y yes, I did. I sort of knew that, that it wasn't working. I, but what I remember very clearly when I got dropped from the label, I was actually, when I found out, I was actually a mutual friend of ours house. I was at my friend Penny's house, who you obviously yeah. know. Yeah. And, um, and I, and that's what I found. And I remember not really caring. Oh, really? You know, no, I didn't really care because I, I sort of think I'd accepted by then that it wasn't going to work okay. and whatever I was going to do was going to have to be something other than that, whether it was going to be with a different label or something else, because I did, I started to record a second album, which didn't really go well, uh, because I, I sort of lacked direction. And I think I lacked direction because I felt so battered mm. by, mm. you know, by the whole experience. I have to say, in, you know, there were people in my label, for instance, the head of my label at the time, Tony Powell, and a few other people who were really great and really supportive to me. And, you know, there were, I did, I didn't feel like everybody was, was down on me. Okay. I just felt like as a mechanism, it just didn't kind of work in the end for me. So I did feel a little bit knocked about by it by the time it came to an end. Okay. That's, that, that... Again, I'm glad to hear that because so many experiences that I've had, particularly on, on this channel and my own experiences was you're dropped, that's it, you're gone. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it was a time in my life where I felt very alone, felt very yes. vulnerable um, and just didn't know where to go next because there was nobody there to help or advise. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of encouraged that you did have people around you, but did these people actually say to you concentrate now on songwriting concentrate on producing because this is potentially a very important path for you ah now let me just clarify something when i said there were people that were supportive of me in the label i was talking about when i was signed I when i was dropped when i was dropped i very was very much was 
you're gone and I didn't hear from anyone. Sorry, that I was the case. Yeah, so that I was, was talking about case. when I was. Yeah, that was pretty much the case. And not only that, but I felt like lots and lots of people in the industry that are people I'd worked with disappeared. And I, I, you know, it's that thing of the phone calls drying up and you suddenly, I did have a period, um, you know, in the early nineties where I, I mean, I went, I went away to Australia and America with a friend of mine and we traveled around for three months, you know, uh, because I, I just didn't know what to do with myself. And I didn't really have uh, anyone advising me or supporting me. Um, so, you know, I, I had a similar experience to that. In, okay. in that way. Okay. So then how did you make the decision to start stepping into what was a very successful songwriting and producing career? What was there a light bulb moment for you, Terry? Well, I have to be, be honest with you that the, the, the thing that first helped me was, um, I, I, I was signed to the same label as um, as Danny Minogue, yeah. and we had become friends during the time I was signed. We got sent to Europe a couple of times together and did promo trips and just really got on. We're still close friends now. I'm seeing her tonight, actually. And um, she had a bad experience with the label being sent to all these different producers, so there was no um cohesiveness in in who was producing her she'd gone to so many different producers she felt like she wanted somebody in the studio that was with her all the time okay. to work on her vocals with her okay. so she had asked her a and r person and if i could go and work with her so that is really how i kind of started with the production side of things going in with dan and producing her vocals for her and i just did it in the way i knew how how i would do my own i hadn't had any training in production i just knew how to get a good vocal out of someone and from that she then when kylie her sister left stock Aitken and waterman she was very nervous about working with new people so danny put me in touch with her and i worked with kylie and it, kind of went from there i just met more people and then it went from, from production to sort of writing and and it went and it sort of went from there it was very much finding my own way mm. um you know uh, until i sort of got the gig of producing an entire album um fr fr from from a label so it it was finding my own way nobody told me to do that or that i would be good at that it was yeah. all basically gut yeah you see what i love about that is that you've got the courage to go and do it because when when we go through such experiences like we did after you get dropped and you just don't know where to go next but you then no. have the courage in your own ability to be able to do that i find that absolutely fantastic um what i wanted to ask you was was did you learn any lessons that you learned from your time as a solo artist did you take anything that you learned into now producing, be it songs or vocally, into what you did afterwards, Terry? What was the one single lesson that you thought, that's vital for me going forward? Well, for what I was doing, my lesson really came from the producers that I worked with, okay. um, who was Harvey and Jimmy, which was how to be with an artist in the studio and how to be nurturing and kind because i had seen a lot of but I, that's one thing and how to how to get something good out of someone because i think danny had had very bad experiences with people mm -hmm. and so my job was to, to 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 get the best out of someone without with you know being being nurturing rather than being a bitch um the other thing i learned generally was I had was about being nice to other people and and respectful to other people because there were another band on my label who were quite successful um but the person and I'm not going to name them that was the front woman of that band mm. was wasn't particularly nice to anyone she, you know people didn't really like her and I think when um when I I sort of carried on for a long time, even though I wasn't having hits, because people kind of liked me and I was nice to people. But I noticed that when people 
um, weren't very nice and their star was on the descent, people dropped them like a hot brick. They were only kind of helped when they were on the up. You know, if you weren't, if you were nice to people, it went a long way. So that was something I've always taken along from my days in, you know, being signed to a label is to just be respectful and nice to other people. I have to say it's so refreshing to hear that because we had exactly the same mentality and we were very strong with that. Always, it, it didn't matter where we went, Terry, and it didn't matter what level of person we met. It could be a runner at a production company. It could be, you know, the director of a major television show. I didn't care what level it was. We always had to be respectful and nice. And I used to say yes. to the lads all the time, please remember to say thank you. And we must go around these individuals and thank them. And I don't care what level they're at. We have to always thank people. And I think yeah. that actually held us in quite good stead. And I yeah. think it made people like us as an act. Um, because when we needed the support, I think the support was coming from people. They would put us on top of the pops. They would put us on the Smash Hits Roadshow, even though our levels were dropping and other bands yeah. were coming in. So I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from with that. Yeah. That's why it leads me quite nicely to my next question about egos and different egos, because there are different levels of egos. How did, yeah. you, how did you cope with people that had egos? How, how, did, you, how did you deal with it? <sighs> It's hard, isn't it? There, there's times when you uh, you have to get a job done, and you know not everyone's easy. I I think re I've been relatively lucky, but there have been times when I've worked with pop stars, and even since with people I've written books for, because you know that's what I do now. Um, where they've been difficult, they expect a lot for not much effort. And they, and for me, the worst people are the people that don't listen, that only hear their voice. Um, and, you know, I'm one of those people that loves to hear when somebody who knows more than me about something enlightens me on it, because I feel great, I'm going to take that on board and I'm going to run with it. Um, but there are a, a lot of people I've worked with, well, not a lot, there are some people I've worked with that, that don't hold that. and. You know, it's no matter what you say or what how you want to do things, their way will always be the best. And and if if it doesn't, but the trouble is, if the product at the end of it doesn't come out as as everyone wanted it to, I, I've found sometimes that I'm the person that's to blame when it's really not my you know uh, when it's you know when I've sort of wanted it to be done differently. I found that a few times. But there's nothing you can do about that. I think if you're a creative and you're working with and for other people, it's it's bound to happen. And there are egos. Um, and I usually find the people with the egos are the people that are the most insecure. Um, so, yeah. I always found the more famous they were, the people that we met, the nicer they were. Yes. But yet the levels of fame, like say, at, at, my or our level of fame i always found people just almost intolerable but the more famous they were the nicer they were um terry you've also you know you, you you've also appeared on a number of television shows over the past few yes. years as well how did you enjoy that experience uh, uh, or didn't you highs highs and lows <laughs> okay. highs and lows I've, I've worked on a lot of tv talent shows yeah I'll, I, you know, I'll be, I worked on X Factor first, um, with da along with Danny. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed working with Danny on the show. I wasn't always a fan of the, the whole format. I, I didn't always feel the, the contestants, you know, got, were, got the best out of it. I, I, I found it difficult, um, sometimes. Whereas when I worked on, you know, The Voice and The Voice Kids, I felt like the, the, the production team on those shows were, were amazing and really kind of nurturing, especially with the kids working on The Voice Kids. I felt like they were great. Um, and it wasn't everybody on, the, on, on those shows that were bad. It was just, I just felt that the, it was such a quick turnover and it was so high pressure. I think sometimes people got kind of a bit trampled over to, to, to make the end product. Pro product. So 
I, I'm not, it's not my favorite genre to work in TV. Yeah, <laughs> I get that. Just, I just don't, I'm not, 25 I, years. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think I'm good at, at being on camera. So I, I'll always, you know, I, I love being behind the scenes and working with, you know, whether it's contestants or a lot of times I've worked on um, shows when celebrities have to go and sing or do something, make fools of themselves. That's what I kind of enjoy. It's fun. And, you know, you get to work with someone and, and it's not too serious. I think, yeah, but, but TV is, it's a lot, as you know, it's a lot of hanging about. Yeah. It's, a, yeah, it, for me, it's not the most creative way of using my time. Okay, just as we're coming towards the end, Terry, one thing that's really struck me while we've been talking, and I've spoken to a few people about you before we came on, because I wanted to get an understanding of your character. And the one thing that everybody said to me about you is that you're incredibly kind. And oh. I, what I, what I sense from you is this kindness and this caring nature to you. And so, which leads me to my question, because you've had an experience of where you have been a pop star, but you didn't quite make it for, for whatever reason. Yeah. So you've had that difficult time in your life. You then stepped into producing and songwriting and nurturing huge talents across the globe. Have you ever thought about becoming a manager? No. Why? No, Why? because I feel like it's a thankless task. And it's also, I don't feel like, I mean, there are management. I mean, a really good friend of mine, Peter, is a manager, and I feel like he's a very creative person. Um, but I think generally, manage, man, management's a, it's a whole other mindset. I think it's uh, doing deals and finding angles. And I think you've got to have real confidence and, you know, a, a bit of a shark-like mentality to be a manager. You know, I'm not the person that can go in there and say this, that, and the other. I'm, yeah, no, that's not me. Okay. Definitely not. Okay. What was your most wow moment in your career? Well, it wouldn't have necessarily been anything to do with uh, music, probably. I, I think I would probably say off the top of my head, I would say it was seeing the musical of my novel come to life on stage in, in Atlanta in 2019 and the audience reaction to what was a book I wrote in my bedroom with no publishing deal, no nothing. I just wrote it for myself. And there it is, two time Tony Award winning, you know, director, director. And this is my show, my musical uh, of my book. Um, and p kids are going wild for it. That I suppose would be the the wow moment because it's something that came from me that was then taken on by other people. And yeah, I think that was it. Terry, it's been absolutely fantastic and fascinating. Thank you so much for telling me your story and Thank coming you. on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. So there you have it. I really hope you enjoyed today's chat with Terry. And if you haven't already subscribed to The Accidental Popstar here on YouTube, I'd be very grateful if you would please consider it as we continue to build and bring you more popstar interviews as we head deeper into 2023. Thank you so much for watching today's chat with Terry. I really hope you enjoyed it. And look out for a brand new episode of The Accidental Popstar coming your way very soon. Thanks for watching. See you soon.